All right, Nathan Chapman is here, which I don't know if you remember. But we've met before. Yeah. At the airport? Yeah. Okay, cool. I was like, I told Mike, I, said, I met him. I don't know if he remembers me, but he was sitting, like, right when you walked through, you were sitting on a little bench. And I was like, you Nathan Chapman? You know, like, yeah, I was like, hey, man, big fan. And I was like, I'm just going to get out because... I don't know if I'm creeping him out right this minute. No, no. That, that was our that was our brief interaction. There was no creep factor at all. Okay, good. That's great. He never. I don't like to bother people like big stars like yourself because I'm sure that people are constantly coming up to you, especially artists who are going, "Hey, if I could just go be nice to Nathan no, Chapman." No, no. And if I'd seen you first, I would have had the same thought. Like, I don't want to bug Bobby, but I want to say hi. Yeah, but I'm probably so good looking. You were, you wouldn't have come. You'd been intimidated. You know, <laughs> you'd, right. you'd have been like, "Wow, I don't know if I can get up there." Yeah. Uh, I was talking to tom douglas in a very similar setting and something that i've just held on to until i was able to talk to you formally like this and you can tell me your version of the story but he speaks okay. very highly of you okay that's nice and yeah, Tom tom is I amazing like, i was like hey yeah tommy hates you man yeah. i don't know if you know or not <laughs> but he was talking about uh raise him up with keith urban yeah and there's the part of the song that's very patriotic and now we know it because eric church sings that part of the song yeah and his story was Keith didn't feel comfortable because he's Australian singing that patriotic American part. Yeah. And it was your idea, why don't we pursue Eric Church for this? Is that Well, it wasn't Eric Church specifically. Mm. But what happened was um we were going to go in the next day and record that song. And Keith called me, I think I was at Green Hills Mall in the parking lot. All of my big interactions in my career has been in parking lots on the phone. Um like moments that I remember. But I, he called me and he's like, man, I, I can't do that verse. I'm, I'm Australian. I respect that patriotic verse too much. I can't sing that. So, a day before. Yeah, going in. yeah. Yeah. But the way Keith and I were working during that time was just me playing a lot of the instruments and then him playing guitars. And so it was just the two of us. So it didn't really matter what song that we did. You know, it wasn't like he was throwing me a curveball as far as like logistics. But um, he, uh, he said, I've got this other song that I feel like is really similar in vibe to that and I'll send you that and we should do that song instead and I said okay cool send it to me so he sent it to me and I listened and and I I think I emailed him back or I called him and I was just like this song is not as good as raise him up like raise him up is is the the big winner to me between these two songs and is there anything we can do to change your mind because I really feel like it's a, an amazing song and I said what about a duet like he's like I'm not singing that verse what about a duet and that was He's like, that's a great idea. And he hung up. And then that was it. Just yeah. that's it. Goodbye, click, nothing, but that's a great idea. He's like, I know what to do. So about an hour later, I get a, a communication from him. I can't remember if it was a call or text. And he's like, Eric Church is coming by tomorrow <laughs> to sing. So that it, that's how it worked out. And I mean, so, you know, credit to Keith for, for thinking of Eric, credit to Eric for being willing to do it late notice. And I guess credit to me for just pushing for a song I really believed in. But that's part of my job as a producer is to help, you know, A&R project. And I really believed in that song. And I knew Keith did, too. But I, I, his his heart was in the right place. I just felt like it was too good a song to just, you know, let it go. The song that didn't end up being cut, I'm not going to ask you what it was, but did it ever get cut by anyone later? I don't know because I can't remember it. I could mm. go through my emails and find it probably. But um, uh, it was... It was really good, and that's the thing about Raise Him Up or any song like that. Like, I remember the story goes is that Abby Adams, who, uh, or Abby Bur Burkhalter, when I worked with her at Sony, and now she's at Red Light as a publisher, she sent that song to Keith, and the subject line said, Song of the Year. And Keith told me, and he's like, when people do that, I usually think it's, oh, this is going to be a terrible song, you know, because people don't talk stuff up. They don't hype stuff like that if it's, if it's real. But he listened to it, and he's like, oh, yeah, that is that good. You know, with your resume of producing albums, I, I was just talking to one of my managers. I have two main managers. One of his name is Tom Betchy. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was just with him. Yeah. Talking about producing, you know, and he went through it. He said, he, uh, yeah, on um, Friday like, or yeah. Fr Thursday or Friday. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I love him. I'm super excited he's coming over. And so I was thinking about, because that's the infancy of that project that you guys might do. I don't even know. I don't know if you're doing it or not. Yeah. But, before you take a project, or let's say you just say, I will produce this artist. Okay. What is the pre of what you have to do before they come in and actually start recording? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I think that 
it's like measure twice, cut once, you know, in construction. It's like the more thought you can put into the project before you get the studio, the better. Sometimes that's the artist is obsessively overthinking what their record's going to be. And I'm there to just kind of help realize it. Do and you then, mean in concept or in sound or because, again, your job is all encompassing. Like you're you're yeah. producing the record. You're right. the guy. Yeah. You know, vocal, sound, everything has got to go through your lens with the help of, you know, the artist. But, but right. it's your name on it. Yeah. But when you mean they're overthinking it, in what way do a lot of artists overthink their, their music? Well, it's different for everybody. I think that um, for someone, since we were talking about Keith, for someone like Keith, like he has a real really clear idea of what his next step is artistically what his next what the next paragraph is in the conversation with his fans um all of our big artists in country music they are having we don't realize it because we're all fans i'm a country music fan i'm a pop music fan i love all music but one thing that country music artists are doing whether the fans realize it or not is they're having a conversation with you they're telling you stories that they want to get a reaction from you, whether it's, you know, something that we're kind of used to about being on a back road or whether it's like, you know, something like where Kane Brown's move where he kind of did that song about love and everybody coming together. And it's like whatever, you know, Miranda might be killing a guy. You know, it's like we're, it's basically we're being told stories by storytellers and any great story doesn't just say the same thing over and over. There's like an arc to it. So depending on where someone is in their career, depending on where they are in their relationship with their fans is where they're going to be in that story. And, you know, if when you think back to great artists like Cash and Haggard and, you know, uh, McIntyre, McBride, I mean, Hill, whatever it is, it's like you when you look back on an artist's career after they've been doing it for a couple decades, you feel like you really have been on a journey with them. If you're a diehard and you're buying every record, listening to every song. And that's what I feel like, um, what I mean by over-obsessed. And the music part of that is kind of subordinate to the story in country music. In pop music, it's like, you know, whatever, the, the, the storytelling is almost in the musical side. It's like, remember when Bieber put the song out, the uh, Where Are You Now, had that weird whistle sound in it? And everyone's like, whoa, what is that? You know, that was kind of his way of talking to his fans. It's like, hey, this is where we're going now musically. We were doing this, now we're doing that. Then we're going to do, was that song Lonely he had? It was like, you know. Lonely, the ballad. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I feel like in pop, it's like, it's it's a similar journey with an artist, but it's a lot more about the musicality of things and where we're going sound wise and what are we partying or are we crying or with country music, it's like, where are we in our lives right now? Like, where are we going through? What are we hurting about? What are we happy about? What are we feeling? Where, what, when we blow off steam, how do we want to do that? Are we at a bonfire or are we at a club? You know, there's all those things. And I feel like, I feel like the best records that I've made have been with artists who have a really clear idea of what's next, what they're trying to say, and uh, who they're trying to be and wh- where they are with their fans. So, um, so like with Keith, it's like he had a really clear vision of what that Fuse album was supposed to be. And in his perfect world, no other album does that. That album did that. And the next album does this. And um, someone like when I was meeting with Tom Betchy, with that new band, uh, Homegrown, that I'm going to work with. I love those guys, and Tom's a great manager. Uh, Autumn House is working with that, too, with that project, too. Um, they're at the beginning of the story. How do you start the story? You know, I think that's one thing about country music that I don't want to get lost the more we um, kind of do business like L.A. and like pop. It's like I don't want to lose the story. That's my biggest thing, and I feel like, the great artists, the people we really look up to in country music, they 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 have that. So extremely macro is what I'm hearing because you're like story wide art. We're gonna, we're gonna then figure out everything that goes inside of the bucket yeah. that you've you've now told me we need to fill. And so if it's a new artist, are you? There's a lot of songs. Are you then picking and cutting songs based on not how good they are, but if it's a tie? Okay, which one better defines where you are right now in making this project? Like all the decisions, even yeah. sounds inside sonically yeah. all those decisions are kind of based on i'm assuming some communication you've had before like where are you and now we're going to make sure everything we put in this bucket is exactly on brand with that well and what's fun about a new artist is that there may not be a bucket and the bucket kind of forms around the water so to speak you know it's like sometimes it's like okay what's going to work like they have to get on the map you know so what what 
of all the songs you've written in the last year, which ones do we feel like might move the needle? It used to be a radio conversation, and, and now it's both a radio and streaming conversation, and XM, and of like, what's going to work? What What's going to connect? Is it going to be a streaming hit, and or is it going to be a radio hit, or is it going to be something that XM will play, or is it just something that will work great live? It's like, you just got to move that needle first and almost like figure it out after that. And a lot of times, the, a brand new artist, they don't have fans, so they don't have a conversation yet. So they don't know what they're supposed to say. They don't know who the people are who are really going to be drawn to them, what age group they're going to be and all that. We'll stick with Keith for a second since um, we were talking about him. Knowing him a little bit, not only personally, but, you know, I've been to his studio in his house and I've seen him, and he's all over the place just as what I see. If it's just him and I, and he's moving, and he's turning things up, and he's like, well, let's watch this, point at this, yeah. go here, oh, my – and you're like, why is he like that to work with too? Where he's got so much energy and he's doing nine things at once and he's got visions that he's explaining, but it's almost you can't understand his vision because it's a vision. Yeah. Is that what working with Keith is like? Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, he's he's definitely before I worked with him, I was like bucket list artist for sure. Um and the first song we ever did was uh the song with Miranda and him. Um I'm drawing a blank. We were us. Um that was the song. It was uh, John Knight, Jimmy Robbins, and Nicole Gallions, all their first number one. And that was the first song I did with Keith. And um, it was a funny story. We were making that song, and he didn't have Miranda's vocal on it, obviously, because we were just building the track. And um, he said, uh, I really wish we had a female vocal on here, uh, just a placeholder, just to kind of get us through the production while we're building the track. And I was like, well, my wife's upstairs, and she's a great singer. And he's like, oh, well, Go get her. And so I went upstairs, and my wife was like seven months pregnant. <laughs> she had adult braces, and she was finishing a Chick-fil-A sandwich. And she had crumbs on her belly, you know, from her belly sticking out. And I was like, hey, babe, Keith's downstairs. He wants you to come sing on this track. And she was like, what? <laughs> Do you hate me? <laughs> I said, come on. Just come down here. It'll be fun. She had a great time. He, she and Keith hit it off. They, like, had a great like rapport and everything and, and she you know she like you know got a little bit dolled up before she came downstairs because she wanted to make put a do a good impression and so like three days later out of nowhere she goes didn't keith have the best scent smelling cologne oh always yeah everybody says that about keith yeah and i'm like are you thinking about him <laughs> three days later out of nowhere you bring this up and she was That's like funny. yeah he, he did smell really good and i was like oh man did do you get to keep do you have that just to keep for your own personal fun yeah it's on like the hard that. drive yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. pretty cool yeah like it's that cool. she has you know a work tape or a demo or whatever what yeah. stage, whatever stage you were um of her recording a keith urban song and she's a great songwriter and singer she um she kind of took herself out of the game for us to have kids and stuff but um when she was in the game she was she had like a bonnie Raitt single with uh that Bonnie did with Nora Jones as a duet. And then she had a couple of songs on the uh, Chief record with Eric. Wow. And uh, her Carolina record. Can't remember. Um, that Keith, Eric still plays live. They, they did a half hour at the Opry together, just Eric and Steph on wow. stage. She, op uh, she opened for Merle Haggard at the Ryman one time. Um, she had a bunch of other cuts. And remember the band Gypsy? Remember I do. Them? Yeah. She had a song that they recorded of hers that was really good. Just random things but she was definitely like she was the reason i got to work with taylor swift so she she was writing songs at jody williams so that music. what what year was that and i want to touch on this but then i want to go back in your life but what year was it where you and taylor first met i think it was 2006 maybe she 2007 been, she'd have been how old 14 or 15 i have a friend that's a songwriter who's written you know quite a few he, i don't think he even care if i told the story i won't say who he is in case yeah. he does care yeah and they came to him to write for her. And he was like, I'm not writing with a 14-year-old girl. He's like, I'm an adult, yeah. man. I don't know what to write for a 14. I've heard, I've heard that story from several writers. So he was like, it was nothing against her personally, but yeah. I was a man in my 30s. I don't know what to write. So I said, no. Yeah. And so now he's like, I'm an idiot. He's like, I'm the best. No, I mean, look, it's like poker. Like you get, you get dealt a 2-3 offsuit, you fold, and then the flop's a 2-2-3. Two, two, well, you... How would you know? Right. I mean, you make a decision as best you can in the moment. And he was, like, statistically, he was right. Most 14-year-old, 15-year-old people who come to Nashville to make records, they either work or barely or they don't work. You know, Taylor was definitely an exception. So 
mathematically, you got to say like he did, he made the call that he thought he should make. Yeah, I still messed up. But <laughs> <laughs> what's the, what's the red what's the red drink over there? Oh, it's like Crystal Light or something. Oh, yeah. Well, have a, have a drink. There was a uh, funny was it Bert Kirzner? Is that how you say yeah, his name? Got, and Tom shirt. Segura, where they had that huge laughing fest over the Kool Aid in his water cup. I don't know if you guys saw that. I didn't it's see so that. So good. No, no. So we've had a couple guys on recently, which we haven't had a, um, a whole lot of this, but they grew up here in Nashville. Yeah. And for for people that grow up here, they are either in music and they're never getting out of it, or they hate music. And then they finally decide later on, they, they're like, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have got out of it. Yeah. So what was it for you? It was, uh, I grew up on my, um, my mom and dad are Christian singers. And they're on the end of their career now. They're about to fully retire. They're, they try to retire. Um, they were, they moved here in the 70s. And my dad had a band and they were signed to Pat Boone's record label. And I grew up on the road. My dad told me when I was potty trained, I could go and tour with him. He'd go out for 30 days at a time in an RV. It was a Christian rock band before Christian rock even really existed. Before Striper. Yes. Um, and uh, the, the, the genre CCM is named after a magazine called Contemporary Christian Music. CCM was the name of the magazine, and that's how they named the genre. And my dad's band's in the very first issue of that magazine, and he's got a copy at his house. What is your earliest memory of your parents doing music? Well, they they did music that was geared toward family ministry. It was like Christian music, like sermons with songs sprinkled in, and they would do like marriage conferences and uh, things about raising kids. And they had a song called Daddy, Please Find a Reason that was about a dad, a guy who wants to leave his family and he can't think of a reason to stay. And then the chorus is this little kid saying, well, Daddy, can that, that reason can be me. If you want to stay here, you know, stay for me. So I was the three. I was three years old when I sang the chorus to that song. Do you remember being three? Just in general, being three, having a memory is crazy to me. Kinda. I mean, it's just. I think I remember more because I've created the version of the story that my parents have told me. You know, but I, I remember being in the studio. The studios always smelled like um, glue and coffee and cedar wood. Studios don't smell like that anymore. <laughs> but the, obviously, we know where the coffee smell came from. The glue came from the tape. If you smell a reel of tape, it's kind of like smelling black powder in a shotgun shell after you shoot a shot. You know, it's like a really distinctive smell that you'll remember. Or cigarette smoke in the air when you're a kid at the, the you know, at a fairgrounds or something. But the smell of glue and then the ce- they were all built out of cedar wood. There was like a, I don't know why. But I remember, I remember the smell of studios back then. It was really kind of intoxicating. You knew, you, you could close your eyes and know you were in a studio back then. Did you, as... A seven or eight year old, when you do probably have memories. Mine start around five or six. Did you always know, like, oh, man, I'm just gonna do music like them. I'm gonna do it because of them. I'm like, why did you want to do music? Well, I, I loved the process of the making the records. I remember being in the studio and watching the producers talk to my dad, and my dad getting mad about stuff later. Like he'd 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 be upset about a snare drum sound or something. Um, my parents were signed to a Star Song, Star Song Records in the 80s. And in 87, they left and went independent. So my dad paid for the record out of his own pocket. And then they would print them. And they printed them over in Sylvan, uh, Sylvan Park area at a little factory. Is where they got, And I'd go with them to pick them up. And they, my, it was very, like, it was very, pra- it was, like, practical and very, like, hands-on. It was, like, I'm paying money for this record. I'm printing it, and then I'm going to take it out and sell it to people. So from a very early age, like I really understood what it was to be an artist who was trying to make it. And my mom and dad struggled till I was about seven, and then they had a kind of a big break and did really well after that. Uh, in in their in their world, they were they won a Dove Award and they did really well for what they wanted. Their goal, they met all their goals. It's pretty cool. You saw them hustle though. Yeah. Like that's a cool thing to remember, to actually see your parents hustle, but to see it pay off. Yeah. Like, those together, that's a package you almost can't pay for, like a big learning lesson. What yeah. was their big, you say a big break, was it a song, was it? it there was a, uh, there's an organization called Focus on the Family, and they did a um, film series where they filmed two or three days of a conference, and then they sent that film to all the churches in America. And they had, like, a set 
in that. So when every church in America watched my parents sing and the head of the organization kind of handpicked them to be the musical guest, even though they were really small time, he liked, because they were a family ministry organization, my parents were doing family ministry music, it just fit. I, when I was growing up, I I saw a lot of hypocrisy from other artists. My parents actually walked what they talked, and they still do. I'm grateful for that. But I saw a lot of hypocrisy out there with in the Christian music world. And I think that I got what I remember I kind of when I was a teenager, I was like, all right, I don't want to do Christian music or a ministry because if I'm going to do music, I want to do it for the money. It's what I've told myself when I was a kid, you know, like 17, 18. I was like, I like I know how this works. I know how studios work. I know what it is to make a record and I know I can make money doing it, but I didn't want to be a hypocrite and out of a feeling of guilt, be a Christian artist or a Christian writer out of just an obligation to my faith. So I made a conscious decision to just kind of say, I'll minister and I'll have my faith and I'll express that and I'll be a, a I'll be a, you know, in God's work in a different way besides the actual music that I make. But I, I mean, I do have some like lines in the sand I won't cross as far as like, you know, certain content or. Sure. Could you listen to secular music? I was allowed to, yeah. Yeah. And what, what did you choose at those formative 12, 13, 14 years? I was obsessed with uh, Sting and Pink Floyd and Seal. Did your parents have conversations with you? Because I find it so interesting that they were like, we're Christian artists, we're, yeah. we're Christians. And we're going to allow you to listen to music that is not what we're involved in. And also, maybe th- this music doesn't have the same values you're taught. But do they do they talk to you about that? There, there was a worship component in the actual music. Like, I think my my dad, he, he was big time into Vangelis, the um, guy who did the Chariots of Fire theme. There's a lot of different... He's kind of like a Hans Zimmer of his time. My dad loved that stuff. He loved Beth Nielsen Chapman songs. He loved Vern Gosden. Um, he would always play me uh, Madman Across the Water, Belton John. And he really found worship in the, just the music. It's like the words were kind of just like whatever to him for that, for the secular music. So it's like, while the, at the same time they were making music, it was very like teaching and, and ministry and, and scripture based. For him, like listening to Gordon Lightfoot wasn't like a sin because it's just great. It's an excellent work. It was like an excellent version of that craft of being a singer songwriter. My dad appreciated that and he found the worship part of that. So I feel like sometimes there's moments when I listen back to something I did and I feel like, no, I'm not going to tell anybody, but I was kind of worshiping when I was even just playing guitar or like doing that different chord change that makes me feel something, you know, it's like, to me, that stuff can be kind of a worship experience. When did you pick up an instrument? Um, I was uh, three when I started playing drums, seven, I started piano and 10, I started guitar. When you're three and play drums, are you just hitting stuff, or do you actually at three? Can you? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can play at three. Yeah. So that's got to be your dad would have to show that off. He's like, "Hey guys, come here, <laughs> watch this, right?" I mean, you have to be the three year old that's being celebrated. This is a theory, working theory. If you're three and you're doing something pretty good, and people are saying, "Ah, oh, look at this kid," and you're being rewarded for yeah. doing something pretty good, it then makes you want to be rewarded more. It's like if I go on stage and I tell a joke and it's pretty funny, I go, "Dang, first time I, this war works." Yeah. I should learn more jokes. I'm be- So I would imagine that that early, hey, you're really good at this kid. We celebrate you. Probably inspired you to continue learning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I remember I picked out the Chariots of Fire theme on piano out from ear. And I remember, like, my mom and dad and their friends, and everybody's like, whoa, I can't believe you did that. And I'm thinking, like, well, the notes are right there. You know, it's not that big a deal to me. But um, I think the encouraging those little wins like that is is huge. And my, my six-year-old... He was five, uh, I think it was like last summer, he got a drum kit and um, he would pull his arm into his shirt to give himself only one arm and then place, pour some sugar on me. He played Def Leppard? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but only with one arm because that's what was on YouTube, you know, watching the Def Leppard drummer. But he didn't have, but he has feet pads, right? Like yeah. the Def Leppard guy? Well, but my kid, he's just like, and he had long hair at the time. He was, he was, he's such a cool kid. You know how some people are just cool? Like, you're cool. I'm, no, you are. <laughs> okay. I, now that I have a cool kid, I always wondered, how do people get to be cool, right? I'm not cool. And, I, and if anyone argues with me, they're just trying to make me feel better. I'm not a cool guy. My six-year-old is a cool kid. And he would 
played Def Leppard, and it, and then I was singing Pour Some Sugar on Me and playing guitar. And he's like, no, Dad, not like that. You need to go, Blossom. <laughs> and he's, like, <laughs> producing my vocal, you know. And I'm like, it's just in his blood. He's just a cool kid. So he, when he's playing drums, it's just cool. But um, Do you see, this is so interesting, because I wonder if your dad saw that in you that you're now seeing in him. Do you see you in him musically? Yeah, I mean, I, if I... If you think back to a five or six, and it's a difficult yeah. thing to do, do you see you there? I feel like, well, I know that my six-year-old looks like me. My parents say it's like the Twilight Zone watching him. It's like having me as a kid again. Um, I feel like that there is definitely, you either kind of have that gifting of music or you don't. And if you don't, you can learn it. It's not like you can't learn it, but there is definitely kind of like it can be a gifting. I think my eight-year-old has that with math. Like he'll do really hard math problems, and he's like, I don't know how I figured that out, but I just know it. Um, my 10-year-old daughter, she can, she kind of has like a novelist thing. She can just write stories that are actually like really good. Um, none of my kids are showing like a real, uh, you know, like gifting in sports. You know, they're, they're all – Kind of like at the moment, and you you never know until they grow up. But right now, I'm not seeing like, oh, he's going to be a huge athlete. But I think that I can see how my parents probably looked at me and they were like, oh, he's got whatever that musical thing is. That part of the brain it just, that responds to or learns. I think that. it just makes so much sense to me. Like that's the thing about I, I don't think I don't think you can build a career on on natural talent on, in any you know, avenue of life, but you can definitely, if it just makes sense to you, you know, like that's the thing. There's a lot of things about life that just do not make sense to me. And I can try and learn them, but I will never be as good as someone who just instinctively kind of has like, and the advantage over me. That's interesting. I, I struggle with music and I play and I, I play as part of my comedy act and, but I struggle with understanding it. Right. But, but my you know, buddy who plays with me, who understands it really well, he can't read something and just remember it for the rest of his life. Where I can, I can, yeah. re I can recall things that I've ever only read once, or I can remember going, okay, I know I've read that. Well, what do I think? It? And it's there. Yeah. But it's just our brains work in, and respond to different things. Yeah. In such creatively, in such different ways. Yeah. And so it's fascinating to me when I see parents. And then kids who naturally have it because, I don't know, did your parents learn it or did they have it? And if, yeah. can you learn it and then pass it down where it's natural? I think you can because I think that there's definitely a big advantage to being around something when you're a kid, you know? But I mean, like, your, let's say your parents. Let's say they, they didn't know anything about music. Yeah. And we obviously are not going to know the answer to this. We're just going to be dumb guys and talk about this for a second like we right. have an idea of what's happening in the yeah. world. But let's say your parents, they it, music did not come easy to them. And but they studied hard, they maximized their potential, mm -hmm. and they're pretty good at what they do, but they figured out how to do it, had a huge career. Them learning that, and then they have you, and to you, it naturally comes. I wonder if the generation above can learn it and then present it naturally through genetically. I, I think if I'm taking a wild guess from... And that's what we're doing totally, yeah. by the way. Anyone wants to send yeah, us Yeah, I'm sure there's like, pediatri like pediatricians who are psychologists who could answer this for for real but i would guess i would guess yes because i think if my dad had been really into finance just i think there's an osmosis to hearing your parents have conversations you know um if my dad was like big and like if he was a day trader i probably would understand what you know options are like i just was on the phone this morning with my friend who was trading options and calls and puts and all this stuff and i told him i was like i don't understand yeah same and he's like what? And I was like, I just don't understand. And he's like, well, it's you're, you know, you're buying and selling the difference between two prices. And I'm like, I, I really. So I think if you if you grow up around like think about like, you know, guys that are professional athletes, you know, they're all they talk about with their friends. You know, I think my kids here are genetically uh, you can't be a professional athlete unless you are somewhat genetically blessed. Absolutely. But unless you're a bowler, anybody I got anybody can learn to bowl. <laughs> but other than a bowler, but I have a I'm, one of my good friends is Steve Hutchinson, who's a Hall of Fame linebacker uh, or offensive lineman, and he obviously genetically, I mean he it's like he's a different species than me. Like he's so big and and imposing as a human. But you talk to the guy, he is brilliant. 
and he he makes you think that football is more of a strategy game than a like the physicality is almost like a, you either have that or you don't but the difference between a professional and a not professional would be the the brain side of that and um, you said it too you, you don't think anyone can succeed on talent alone and i agree with that yeah. my most talented friends are often the ones that were so talented they didn't have to learn how to do it or have to develop a drive or a, or or have an instinct they had to sharpen yeah. because it was so easy to them that when it got to the point to where it was time to go next level it wasn't easy to them anymore so they weren't comfortable with having to grow into that right or i had no talent whatsoever which is why i'm here we are <laughs> I've, I've been crafting and cutting the whole time you I mean, you're a great communicator though i mean uh, and ask my wife well uh, <laughs> i mean you, you are when you're at your job professionally yeah. i think i'm a plus i mean i've listened to your stuff and it's it, it's 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 really inspiring and interesting the whole time. I mean, you you and John Mayer had a great banter back and forth, where I was like, "Wow, these these guys are really good at talking." Like, and and Bobby is so good at. And John even complimented you in the interview. I don't know if you remember that. Or he's like, "I do." Yeah, I think about it every day. I listen to it before I go to bed every night. <laughs> I'm like, "All right, all right he's going to bed. Play." He's like, he's like, "Wow, you're really good at asking questions." And like, I think that that's. But see, I think that the the musical ability that someone has is almost like being a really big guy and wanting to play football it's like okay you're you know you're really tall you want yeah. to be a professional basketball player well you're 10 percent of the way there now you need that you probably need that in order to do it at a really high level you need that extra 10 percent, but it's only you know it's only a little bit and i think mine came from just being around the business being around music watch i mean when you're three years old and you're in the studio with a an engineer and a producer. I mean, there's that's got to have an effect on you. A lot of accidental learning. Yeah, you yeah. said it, osmosis. I mean, you're you're picking up all the stuff you don't even realize you're learning. It's just the culture. Yeah, I mean, I think my dad always called me a NASCAR kid. He's like, you're like a NASCAR kid. It was you know because those sons always the juniors always grow up and become NASCAR drivers. And he's like, you just were around this. That's what he. That's how he explained it to me. They ever mm -hmm. try to talk you out of it? Like, hey, maybe you try to be a lawyer. Maybe you try. <laughs> ever were they ever like? No. I, they're very – I'm very lucky. Uh, they're did you ever really leave? supportive. Did you ever leave Nashville? I, I did. I went to college. That's where I met my wife. And I quit the family band to go to college. And my sister cried. Like, she wept for a day. She's like, you're breaking up the family. I told my parents, I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't be in the family band anymore. I got to go be my own guy. And I actually quit music. I gave up music to go to college. I had, I, I had all kinds of music gear. I gave it all to my neighbor. I just went to college with, like, a guitar. And where did you go to school? Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee, okay. near Chattanooga. So you stayed somewhat close, but you did leave Nashville. Yeah. And what? And you go with just a guitar. So what? what that was just for me to. I was going to be an English professor. That's what I wanted to do. That was your rebellion. You yeah. know, some kids they do some crazy stuff. <laughs> Yours was the ultimate rebellion was to be an English professor. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I'm here for it. Do because your parents have such history in Christian music. And, I mean, you have a double word yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Do people think that you and Stephen Curtis Chapman are brothers? N and, uh, they think we're family at some point. Uh, a lot of times people get confused with that. Or actually, uncle or whatever, because he's older than you, obviously. Well, Stephen Curtis Chapman would be known as Steve Chapman if it wasn't for my mom and dad. Because? he. So my dad is Steve Chapman. My mom is Annie Chapman. And, and uh, by the mid-'80s, they were pretty big deal they hadn't had their big break yet but they were definitely had a record deal and they were on the radio and stuff and um and then steve steve and curtis chapman got a record deal and he everyone called him steve chapman and they were like dude you gotta figure, <laughs> figure out your name you can't there's already a steve chapman because my dad was the lead singer of his band and then he was a duo with my mom and uh so he's like well how, i don't know how you know what do i do to differentiate myself so they just went with his full legal name Whenever you're, you did you graduate at uh, Lee? Lee uh, yeah. Okay. You finish. Did you not want to be a professor anymore? Did you try it for a little bit? So I was in college and I wanted to get. I went a little bit late, so I wanted to get done quick. So I went on a summer class, a summer course to get my language credit knocked out. Went to Normandy, France, with my college group to do a six week crash course in French and get eight hours of credit so I could graduate early. And my wife is from Virginia, from the D.C. area, and she majored in French and English at JMU. And she was working at the little bed and breakfast in, in Normandy in for, for a summer job.
to go over as with her French skills. You met her in France? We Am met I hearing France. this right? Yes, we met in France in a little town called Franceville in Normandy. Okay, that's funny. It's also just funny you'd meet another American in France while you're studying. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, they were, they had like a uh, couple of American kids who were just there for a summer job, like a cool summer job. Did you guys hit it off immediately? Yeah, and the the way we met is because they told me they said there will be a guitar there. Some they said someone on the staff has a guitar, and that was my wife. And she's a songwriter and singer. And she, one of the first nights we hung out, we just played each other songs we'd written, but not in a like a oh you're so good. It was like a competition. She was like oh you think that song's good? Well I wrote this one, and it was obviously she was better than me. She's really good, and um, so we met, and then we moved back to, and and she said I've always dreamed of going to Nashville. And I said, well, I know how that works, you know. And, but I didn't have any plans to do music. But then when she said, I've always wanted to be a, a singer-songwriter in Nashville. And uh, so I said, well, you know, I know how that works. So we, I started making, um, like, demos for her songs. And that's how she ended up getting signed to Jody Williams' music. And she started co-writing with Liz Rose. And Liz heard my demos that I was making for Steph. I was building all the tracks, playing everything. Liz heard my the Stephanie demos and said, well, will you do demos for me too? I was like, sure. So then she start, Liz started writing with Taylor. And Liz asked Taylor, can my demo guy demo these songs we're writing? And they were like, our song and Picture to Burn and Tim McGraw. So I was doing all the demos for Liz and Taylor as they were writing. And uh, so, yeah, that's I, I, I quit. You know, I quit, stormed out of the musical world and didn't want to go back and to impress a girl, I got back into it. So Liz, who I, I love and and know Liz, she's like, produce these demos, but how produced were the demos? Were they, you know, you got instruments, drums, or yeah. was it, uh, you know, just Taylor, a vocal? I, I, like, what was, the, what was the early Taylor demos like? They sound like the first record. Did, they, did yeah. a lot of them turn into the record? Uh Tied Together with a Smile is just the demo upgraded. It's one of the tracks on that first album. And uh, But we we went in and recut a lot of that stuff because I didn't have a budget. I was just playing everything myself. You know, demos are still kind of cheap. Uh, you try to make it as cheap as you can. But then when uh, I remember when um, Scott and Taylor called me on speakerphone and said, hey, you know, we want you to go in and, and track some songs. It was basically an audition. Scott was like, this guy, the demo guy, you, Borchetta, wanted... you mean Scott yeah, Borchetta? Yeah, Scott Borchetta. Because Taylor, she had been in the studio with a couple of different people, and she just felt like that the demos we were making really captured what she wanted. And I was 28, and she was 14 or 15, and neither one of us had a clue what we were doing. We were just making music. I certainly didn't have any clue what was going on. I was just making songs. Why do you think she was drawn to what you two were doing versus what she had experienced so far? Well, I mean. I was playing all the instruments. I There was a couple of times I would bring in bass and drums from uh, rhythm section guys, but I was playing all the guitars, and I think it just, I think it just sounded younger, maybe, than, like, the way, even now, it's like, you know, there's the track guy. I'm making air quotes for people who are only listening. The track guys in Nashville where they program the drums and they get a sample from Splice. Well, sometimes that stuff is just captures the magic. It just sounds like what is going on or what's, what's happening. It doesn't sound old and stodgy. I think some, for some reason when we would make those demos and then she would go in the studio with a, a producer and with a band and it would almost kind of like take the cool out of it, I guess. That, and it, it's happened to me. I've been the guy who's took, taken the cool out of songs where you have a demo that's just awesome. It's really cool. And I'm sure you've heard those. I'm sure artists are like, Hey, I just wrote this song. What do you think of this? You know, before it's even been recorded, then you go and record it and it's better technically but it's just not as exciting you know and there was something to what me and taylor were doing where it was like she was writing these songs that were super oddball for the time you know tim mcgraw was the title of one of the songs you know they were not they didn't fit anywhere and then i was doing these productions that really didn't have any business being in nashville i was more i was trying to make like pop music with country instruments kind of thing so we were just a good fit with that and um she just she went to Scott Borchetta and she's like, I really think these demos just sound more like me. And and he, to his credit, he gave he gave me a budget. He gave a demo guy a budget who'd never really done anything, and gave me a shot. 
so when Taylor's making Tim McGraw, which you just brought up, which is a good example, it didn't sound or feel or it wasn't like what was happening here at the time. Well, I mean, it kind it it was and it wasn't, you know. I mean, her her youth and her her songwriting, her perspective, her story, which was, you know, I'm in high school and I'm feeling I'm feeling these feelings and I'm feeling rejected or I'm feeling like I'm in love and you know, that combined with a 28-year-old guy who doesn't really know what he's doing, but it all kind of came together, you know. Do you have to when you're producing and it doesn't have to be Taylor, but it can be, but a, somebody young who's a teenager, I'm just assuming you have to handle them in a room differently than you would handle an artist that's been there many, many times. Just yeah. the psychological part of it's tough. Yeah. So with Taylor, you don't know what you're doing. She doesn't know what she's doing. How do you communicate? Okay, well, I don't know if we like how that vocal went. Let's do it again. What was that communication like? Well, it, I think it, we didn't realize it at the time, but because neither one of us had any kind of reputation or any kind of like, you know, success, it was just honest. You know, I remember one time I was like, you don't sound good today. Go home. We'll work again tomorrow. You know, I, and would I say that to a big famous person? You know, especially not when I was young. Um, and then she would be like, you know, dude, that track is horrible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, we're just saying what we felt. And there was no, I wasn't worried about making a big famous person mad. And then sometimes I feel like new artists, when you're in the room, like me being a more of a veteran and then being a new artist, I feel like they want to they want to tell themselves that I must know more than them because I'm older and been doing this longer. But there's a beauty in just like being super honest with people. And if you do it out of love and you do it because there's a common goal of making something great, then hopefully it doesn't offend. When you make the record, did you do the entire album? Yeah. So you make the first album. And this is the most cliche question that I can ask, but I just... Did you feel like there was a shot at something right there? Something more than just a good record that may have a couple hits, which is what everybody wants. Yeah. Did you feel like, all right, we might have something groundbreaking? Well, I will. you have to put it in the context of where, where I was at the time, where she was a young artist, you know, 15, and I think Billy Gilman was, and Leanne Rimes were the only two kind of like people who, had been successful before her. And Scott Borchetta and Big Machine Records had two artists besides Taylor, Jack Ingram and Daniel Peck. And I remember collectively between those two artists, Big Machine had only sold maybe 50,000 albums as a label. So my hopes were high from a creative place and from knowing that Taylor was really, really good, like that she was very very special as far as like songwriting talent her communication skills and as an artist but business wise i was like this probably won't be that big a deal because for the same reason you mentioned my songwriter friend earlier like you said you just looked at the landscape you saw what was being created and sold yeah and it probably just looking at the numbers mathematically yeah. wasn't going to be that big of a deal yeah. Even if it was great, even if it was the greatest freaking yeah. thing ever, yeah. mathematically, it probably wasn't going to be as big of a deal as as you had hoped. Well, well the the story of Big Machine Records could be its own documentary of like a David and Goliath thing where Scott, you know, he had investors pull out, like he had I mean it was we they were painting the walls in the building. The paint was still wet. It smelled like wet paint in the Big Machine office when we were stuffing the envelopes to send out her first single. It was so new and I'd been in Nashville, grew up here long enough to see companies start and fail, you know? So I wasn't like, if I if I said I was some kind of savant and could see the future that this was all going to work, I'd, I'd be lying. But a lot of people in town didn't know. It's I will say this. It's not like I didn't believe. It's just I didn't know. I was just like, this, this could go either way, you know? Tim McGraw, Teardrops on My Guitar, our song, Picture to Burn. Uh, I mean... Uh, should have said no you know inside of that were there any of those songs and it could have been could have been a deeper cut too where you're like wow she is quite the communicator here like uh, i've been working with people around here that can't do this communication at this level yeah well i mean our song she wrote by herself when she was like 14 and if you think about the lyric of that chorus it's really genius that was kind of the first time i was like oh dang like mm. 
who is this person? Because our song is a slamming screen door, you know, sneaking out late, tapping on your window, talking on the phone, you know, is the way you laugh. If you think, if you break that down, like if you put that chorus in a, in a college literature course, you'd be like, okay, our song, the chorus, everything she's describing is sounds, you know, it's like a slamming screen door. Uh, tapping on a window it's like that's pretty genius you know for basically a a, you know a kid a minor for you know writing that kind of stuff by herself I was like this is really next level writing and I was always a fan of 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 her songwriting ability and 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 understood how good it was but like I said it was like I don't know if it's going to work but it's really good (laughs) so it works that first record works obviously do you worry that as the guy who didn't know what he was doing, this is what you said, that now, okay, well, she has some success. She, they're probably going to get somebody now really good. Like, do you worry about that, or do you go, for, oh, they have to go with me. We just did this together. Oh, I mean, I think that from the first record to the second record, there, we, there wasn't any time to catch your breath. I mean, we... Oh, just hit, just hit the ground running. So yeah, no- Fearless came. We started recording Fearless right away because she was writing those songs. And then Speak Now was definitely a lot of pressure because we'd won album of the year at the grammys for fearless and we were like okay everyone in the world's going to listen to this album that was the difference between fearless and speak now when we made fearless it was like people might hear this you know but speak now is like everyone's going to listen to this do you think <laughs> if you go back in time and there was a, more of a gap between record one and record two do you think with success that have been like let's let's go to somebody who's done this with some bigger artists do you think that you were obviously not lucky because of your skill set, but lucky in the timing that since you were just going, you got to keep going. Yeah. And if there would have been a longer break, they would have looked for a more established producer. Yeah. And eventually they did. Um, you know, Max Martin came in. Uh, but that's when the, the pop stuff, album. though, right? Yeah. And that's and that's how I sleep at night. I'm like, oh, she she didn't fire me. She just changed genres. <laughs> oh, I always I always felt that way. I felt like you know that was a switch because she switched. But I just think it's so amazing that. She had to continue making. She didn't have to, but you guys kept making music between yeah. one and two. And if there would have been a break, that have been like, "Hey, the record was such a success. Maybe we upgrade in producers." Yeah. Well, they. Yeah. And it, the insecurity that we all have as music makers would would say that yes, I was thinking that. I was also just really focused on enjoying what we were doing and trying to make the best music we could. And and I figured like it can't go forever, you know, but. I was grateful that she came back. And yeah, if there had been a long time or if the first record hadn't done very well, like the first record sold a lot too. Yeah. If, if, if something had happened where it was like a real, you know, face plant, like on a release or something, I think that, that would have, that would have happened earlier, but we were, we were together from the first album, second, third half of red. And then I had one track on 1989. So it was like really good time. Was that a call? Like, Hey, just we're not going to use you anymore. Was that a or just a fade? Out? I mean, I've been faded by a lot of people. I know what that's like. <laughs> how how did how did that go? Uh, it was it was handled as best as it could be. It's it's never easy to to. I mean, we were working together, you know, a lot for a long time, and it's. But I I I'm so proud of her for all the different moves she's made. She's somehow she's managed to stay relevant and important for so. For so many records, and that's just not easy. Like, people don't really do that, you know? Yeah, people don't stay number one famous and number one success for that amount of time. Like, you have a window. Yeah. Sometimes it's four to six to seven years where you're just A+. plus. You could stay A+, plus and A- minus and B+, plus and go back to A. But she has stayed legitimately A1 mm-hmm. for, what, 15 years. It's yeah. It's been crazy to see. I mean, she might be... If you were to weigh it out, Brittany Taylor, I'm thinking of just like the most famous yeah. person that's not the president. <laughs> Oprah. Yeah. You know, there's only a few of them that you could just go. They have been famous and super successful the whole time. And you have a, you have a massive part of that. So you ha- you produce all, so many records. Do you ever get in a room? Because mm, I do this, and I don't want to admit that I do this, but after you do something for a long time at a high level, it almost becomes easy and you just kind of fall into place and sometimes you got to recheck yourself does that ever happen to you you're just being asleep at the wheel 
Yeah, I yeah. hate to say asleep at the wheel, and it's a hard thing to to admit to. Where it just you're crushing it, and you're like, well, I just want to keep crushing it. I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. You almost don't challenge yourself because it's happening at a high level. So why would you challenge yourself any differently than you have been? Because you're, but when I do that, I tend to, uh, it tends to, tends to get a little stale. Yeah, I, I think that, fortunately for me, I have had just enough failures to keep me awake. Um, but were you failing in those early? Once you you're producing these records, I gotta imagine everybody's yeah. coming to you then. Kind of, yeah and no. Did uh, you have I, any big bombs? You don't have to say the artist, but records oh. that you did were. The, they were like, what? Man, it just didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how long do we have? Okay, good. I like to hear that because <laughs> it's like, dang, you just touched it and it turned to gold. No, like, no, no. And that's the beautiful thing about this business. And Dan Huff and I were talking uh, uh, a while back, and he, he actually he was on a podcast that Kevin Kadish and I started about songs that were written that have never been hits. Um, and uh, you'd be a great guest on there. I've written a lot of songs that weren't hits. Or I've written a lot of songs Songs that, that you believe should have been a hit, <laughs> oh, but yeah. weren't. That's a good one. It's, it hasn't, the podcast hasn't come out yet. Season one's done. It's called Uncut Gems. I'm sure it'll be out soon. CAA is helping us figure out where we're going to land it. Um, but Dan was on that um, podcast talking from his perspective about songs that he believed in that haven't been cut, that were never hits. And, um, and he said the beautiful thing about this, this business is that no one really keeps track of the failures. You know, he's like, as ba- we're like baseball players. It's like you bat 300 yeah. for your career and you're considered a genius. Well, that's 70% of all your attempts didn't work, you know. I could, there's a long list of things that I've done. And the other thing, too, is like the older you get, the more young people coming up who are the 28-year-old me, you know. I'm in my 40s now, so there's 28-year-old kids coming up that are whipping my ass. You have so many, you have so many credits in the producing world. And I know, for example, you wrote uh, Darius Homegrown Honey, which was the number one song. Were you not writing as much then because you were so just producing all the time? Yeah, I, the the writing thing for me has always kind of been like a way to take a day off from the producing grind but still be making music, you know? Um, and uh, I, the, the writing thing has always ne- – it's never really – like cross pollinated that much with my production. It's like the the writing things that I'm proud of. I usually didn't produce, and the stuff that I produce, I haven't written. But you know, I wrote like uh, Black Like Me with Mickey Guyton, and uh, got to produce that as well. Wrote a, a bunch of songs on, you know, some records coming. I have Michael Bublé cut cut came out on Friday. Um, are you mo- are you doing that more intentionally now? Writing. It's just I want to make music every day. So some days if I don't have anything to produce, I'm going to try and write a song. I, I love the writing process because I feel like writing is a lot about addition and production is subtraction. And production can get kind of taxing emotionally because it's a lot of no. Like better, the better producer you are, the more you're muting and saying no because you want to get it down to the simplest thing. And a writing session is like, what if we did this? And what if we did that? It feels more like addition. Like it's like an upbeat. Like when I write a great song, I, I – come out of my studio, walk in the kitchen at the house and kind of on cloud nine, you know. If I produce really well that day, I kind of like need a glass of wine. Like I just need to like chill because it's pretty intense for, for my brain. That's just how my brain processes those two things. And so the, the writing, even if I write a great song, it doesn't get cut. It might put me in a better place emotionally and musically to produce the next day or, you know, that kind of thing. It's like I can't just produce all day every day or I would feel like it's just too negative. It's a very negative space. Do you have a, uh, we'll say a body work, a song that you listen back to and you're like, man, that was really me doing the best I can do. Like mm. it's just three minutes that you're so proud of. And it doesn't have to be a hit, but if, if I ask you that question, like what comes to mind? I, I hadn't listened to the Fearless album in a long time and I put it on like last year and I listened to the um, Untouchable cover that's on there or the song that, you know, the Barlow guys did. And I was like, really good i don't know if i could do that now (laughs) like it it sounded like all the gears were working in my brain then you know i didn't have kids then and i just (laughs) i just lived and breathed 14 hours a day just music you know um and now i've I've got songs that are just work tapes where i'm like i really like that but i it's it's pretty rare for me to really high five 
like past me. Yeah, like, as it should be. Yeah. I mean, I hate everything I do. Yeah. I can't listen to my voice. <laughs> I, I hate it. I mean, I, I played someone Namaste the other day. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, listen, I, I don't listen to that. Yeah. It's so good, though. Ah, thanks. Well, listen, that was. That could be your uncut gem if you come on. That <laughs> is such a smash. Uh, it's not, but no, it you. is. It's not. Listen, I played it for. We were talking about like, oh, we should write a. You're a real uh, life guy. Don't act like what. No, that, I, uh, I. And feel, I and I remember I'm so embarrassed. You played I never it, get embarrassed. You played it on the radio, and I heard. I was driving home or something that morning, and I I remember I I tweeted something, and then like ten minutes later, you're like, Nathan Chapman just tweeted he liked my song, <laughs> and I thought you were making fun of me. No, but, no, it's it's so good, dude. Well, I gotta give. That was me and, at the time, a songwriter in town who was an artist really struggling. That I was like, man, this guy's good. And I was playing him. But it's Walker Hayes. We wrote that together. We went yeah. to the shack and we wrote that. And we were like, well, I don't know who's ever going to hear this. You know that little shack? Is it behind the building? That's where I started producing Taylor. On Music Row? Yeah. Right really? Yeah, that, that was the little one-car garage studio that I was camped in for like three years when I was doing all those demos for Liz and my wife. And On Taylor. its resume, Taylor's and Namaste. I mean, that's a pretty heavy. <laughs> that's a magic pretty... little room, though. I, I'm so happy to hear that you did that in that room. Yeah, we that, did. That room has something in it. We wrote it. There's like we... a radiation coming out of the ground that has like music in it or something. And I was like, Walker, I just don't know if I have like the swagger to put. He's like, You got it, man. You got it. And we went in the studio and just him and I, you know, just doing. He's like, Man, you got this. And I just remember being so pumped up by Walker. So I did it. And we wrote it and I recorded it. And I was like, I'm. This sounds so stupid. And then it was pretty. It is pretty good. I'll say it was pretty good. The end. All right. Well, how can you get? How can you and Walker do a version for for him now that he's he's got an even bigger platform? He fired me. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't know. I <laughs> no that I, song. I, you guys co-wrote it, right? Yeah, it's just him and I. All right, Walker. Yeah. Put that on your next project. Mm. It's so good. Wow. You, where do you keep your Grammys? You have three Grammys. Three yeah. Grammys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where do you keep them? They're in the studio, and I have um. There, there, there's three, so they're, they're, uh, it makes an incomplete square, right? So there's like one, two, three, and there's a one missing. So I r- took a piece of paper and I wrote, the Grammy for the music we're working on today goes here to make like a perfect square. And so that's where I keep them. I keep them there to remind me to try and do good work, you know? Do people, I'm assuming people come over there and see yeah. that too? I mean, I would be inspired if I came over and we recorded Namaste too, and you're like, "This, this is what we're working for right here to fill yeah. this spot." Yeah, there's a there's a there's a spot that where this gram the next Grammy goes, and it's going to be ours. Yeah. So, this is a dumb question, but in what capacity do you feel like, we'll just say an award, like your your neck, because you, you've done you've got uh, CMA, ACM, a couple Dove Award. I'm going from memory here, so I yeah. messed up uh, Grammys. What? What world are you working in now? And not the artist, but is it producing? Is it songwriting where you feel like, I got a good shot at something here. If yeah. I were to win something, it would be in this area. Well, um, I produced three songs. I co-wrote four and produced three on Mickey Guyton's new album. And it's nominated for Country Album of the Year. And I guess the Grammys are next week, next weekend or whatever. Oh, you really could get that fourth one. Well, here's the thing. Then you got to make a Pentagon well, and then do the... I could put I could put a <laughs> fake one there, but... The, w- the way the Grammy rules work is that you have to have produced 51% of the album in order to get the actual hardware. So, and I'm super happy for it if it happens, but Karen Kosowski would get, she's got the 51%. She's got the Grammy if it wins a Grammy. But I got close, so. So to get the hardware, but are, can you claim? The- I could claim that I produced songs on a Grammy award winning oh, album. Yeah, that's and tough. I'm really picky about the, t- I don't want to say like I won a Grammy. Even though it's Ken, it's Karen's, you know. What's the vibe in your studio? Um, it's kind of like uh, gold curtains and black painted shiplap, and like uh, my wife decorated. It's like gold and black. And I'm not necessarily a Vandy fan, but you'd think I was if you came over. You and your wife, maybe your like your parents, the two of you on the road, singing songs, no. a little song. <laughs> kids are gonna kids are getting a little older. Yeah. No, no chance. No, I think my mom and dad are they're uh, they're pulling the RV into the driveway at this point in their career. Well, but that's why I'm saying you're taking over the RV, yeah. you and your wife, because <laughs> you put out a record, uh, what like seven years or so ago? Yeah, is that right? Yeah, with intention of what? Just wanted to do it. Just needed to scratch the itch. I had a bunch of songs, and it just it popped in my head. I haven't had that itch show up since. I played. I did like a 
I mean, this is seven years ago. We still did CD release parties, you know? <laughs> I um, know. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, yeah. it sounds yeah. so old now to say that. I'm um, sorry, anyone who's under 30 for saying those words. But um, I had uh, Martina was on the front row, Charles and Dave from Lady A, and they were all hanging out listening. And Pete Fisher was there, and he was the head of the Opry at the time. He was just my friends. But Pete kind of, I could see him kind of looking around the room and his, his wheels are turning. Right after I got done, he came up and he's like, I want you to do this on the Opry, these songs. And I was like, okay. So that was cool. So I just, I put a record out just for me. My friends really appreciated it. Um, I had a song on there I wrote with Andrew Dorf, our, the songwriter who passed away a few years ago that I'm really proud of, that one. And just made it just because I, I just needed to make something. And I also... I ask a lot of times I work with artists, new artists, and I'll say, if I, if you had to strip down what you do to just a piano and your vocal or just a guitar and, and your vocal, like what would you be if you were in that spot? And I hadn't asked myself that question in a long time. And I turned that question on me and I was like, that's a hard question. So I think going through that process made me a better producer and music maker and better collaborator and a better friend to artists who are stressed out like sometimes when you're a producer and and there's so when you're on the macro level there's so many things going on and then you know the artist will call you at 11 at night and be like the shaker's too loud in the mix and you're like what you care about a shake you know you can almost kind of get like a little bit numb to the to the details just because there's so much going on and then i was but i was the guy obsessed about the shaker you know or the it probably gave you a re-perspective. It was. It was like a recalibration mm -hmm. of because I had come out of all that that Taylor journey, all that success, and all that stress and intense. That's just that intense intense existence that I was in, and I needed to just kind of like just make music for no good reason. What do you do for fun now, musically? Not a hobby, but what's fun for you musically? The most fun thing for me is to play bass. I love playing bass and. I'll play bass on the session now. It's been the last few years I've kind of moved from being the acoustic guitar player on a tracking date to being the bass player. And I just love that instrument changes. The way you play the bass changes the whole band more than an acoustic guitar. You know, acoustic guitar is like a glorified shaker in a country band. But the bass, I mean, the way you play, the notes you choose, the tone you choose, all that stuff kind of, it really talks to the music of, of what's going on. And so if I had to do something for fun, like sometimes I daydream of like going on the road as a bass player with a really cool artist and just being in that headspace. I love that. Would you ever, I'm just going to use an artist and I don't even know if you have a relationship with them, but like a, like an Eric Church or Artist Eck, would you say, hey, I'll fill in if your bass player ever goes down. Do you think yeah. you could pick it up in two days, like learn what the set, like do you, could you take that in, digest it and then yeah. play it in two days? Yeah. I texted Keith and I was like, if Jerry Flowers gets a cold, call me. Because <laughs> I played on that, uh, the Speed of Light, I think. Speed of Sound? Speed of Sound yeah. EP that Keith put out. I'm playing bass on a few of those tracks. I didn't produce or write anything. I just was the bass player. He, he and I, he, he brought me in as a bass player. He, he was super cool to do that, but he, he wanted to shake up that seat in the band a little bit. Of all the tracks you sang background on, mm -hmm. Which can you hear your voice most distinctly? And it's like, dang, why do they turn me up so much? Okay, there, that's uh, the song Ours, or Ours, how do you say Ours? O-U-R-S. It's hard to say that word by itself. Uh, that is on the, is that the Speak Now record? It was a bonus track, I think, with Taylor. And um, I remember we were mixing the record, and she kept telling Justin Ebank, she's like, turn Nathan up, turn Nathan up. Well, if you listen back to it, it sounds like a duet. Like it, I'm, <laughs> I'm as loud as she is, or even louder than her in a couple spots. And so, yeah, that's one where I'm like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of Nate. Hey, Reed, you get you one question here. Reed right, is here Reed's my go. video guy, but he's also a big music nerd. <laughs> okay. What is your question for Nathan? Let's see. So, with the amount of new artists you've worked with, and even just the younger artist, um, what advice would you give uh, to someone who's coming up or just new that's trying to find their sound? Because I know that's just, like, that's such a hard thing, especially when you're um, about to put out your first record or something like that, worrying about, like, that's what's going to staple you down to what you're known for. So, like, what's the what's yeah. advice you would give in that area? Yeah, finding your sound, I think, um, I, I, th I think I'd 
in a perfect world, you would discover your sound. Okay. You would, you would, you, it would reveal itself to you through trial and error and through figuring out what, what you feel like your story could be with your fans. You know, I think if you think about like, uh, like Dan and Shay, you know, they found, they, they had that sound very early on. I co-wrote one of the songs on their first record with them and, and it was like, you know, basically we've got this singer who's so good. What do we just want to do to make that voice sound even better? You know, so, and then there's other people who find their sound based on their songwriting. Like they write, they just have a, a propensity to write pop country or to write traditional country or whatever it is. Like, like if you're Ashley McBride, finding your sound seems like it'd be pretty no brainer. It's like I've seen country music and I play my acoustic and just make that bigger, you know? So I feel like if you are in a place where you really are trying to find your sound and you just can't find it, there's other questions that need to be answered first. Who, who are you? What are you trying to do? What do you, like, what's the, what's the true north of your music? You know, like if a traditional country artist, like I remember when George Strait put out, leave you with a smile. It was like, Oh, that's a, that's a departure from what we know is George. Yeah. But at least we know what George is, you know? And I feel like, an artist who really can't find their sound, that's the least of their problems. <laughs> For sure. You know what I mean? Awesome, man. Well, listen, we've been here over an hour. I I don't know why you... Why did you have me? What, are you, what do you... <laughs> We spent the last hour talking about why we had you. No. This is not what you ask at the end after we've gone through and picked through your entire life and all of your awards and no, I mean, theories, and that's I'm, why. I'm very honored to be a part of this and uh, of the Bobby cast. And... Because I think that you have definitely brought a um, just an excitement into the conversation about country music. You know, your radio show and and uh, all the things you're doing is just uh, man, you're just you're just a great advocate for what we're doing. And I think part of it's because you're not afraid to challenge the town huh. and challenge the status quo. So well, thank you for that doing is, that. That, is, that sometimes if we can't handle you. Hard. <laughs> then we've got you know. Then we need to quit. You know what I mean? Like if you push back on something in Nashville and 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 it can't withstand a little criticism or a little question, then then it's not right. And I think you've made our town better. So I appreciate that. We definitely didn't expect the success of this specific podcast. We I just enjoyed it, and I enjoy talking to songwriters and producers, and that includes artists who are song. I mean, that was just the idea was let's go second and third layer that often doesn't get enough time spent on it. Right. And so we didn't predict the success. We liked the success. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate you saying that. And I'm just a big fan. Just like when I came up to the airport and I was like, hey man, I'm a big fan. And I just kept walking. I was like, hey man, I'm a big fan. I like you. I just kept walking. <laughs> and then I was like, I don't even know if I said my name. So, no, um, that's all. You're, you're, you're great, man. That was great. And, um, so yeah, and you got to come on me and Kevin's show and okay, when play you get, Namaste. When you, no, I'm not. No, no. <laughs> I, this Please. is what I, we could highlight that for a split second, but I had, there's a couple songs. I think, uh, she don't love you. She just lonely. The Eric, the Eric Pasley song. Yeah. Can't believe it wasn't a massive hit. Yeah, I think it ended up getting a CMA and like a maybe like a hit eleven. But when it comes to songs, where I'm like, I don't understand how this isn't a hit. Yeah, I. That's you, that's you, the one. Your when, perspective on that whole journey of like this song is great, but it is not a hit. Like that would be really interesting to talk to you about how you see that because that's got to be something like you're just talking about. You've you've observed you have observed that, but I'm telling you. If, if okay, nom- I'm not listening to this. <laughs> no, 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 okay, I'm telling that's you. That's a wrap. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Nathan Chapman, follow him. Nathan Chapman official. And uh, for like 10 bucks, he'll produce your record. That's what I hear. Yeah. It's, like, it's like $10 right now. Get it while it's hot, yep. while supplies last. All yep. right. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you.